I'm glad that you were able to attend our conversation with Dr. Angela Duckworth, who is the uh, Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she has a very interesting developmental trajectory. As I understand it, she left a demanding job as a management consultant uh, in New York City to uh, teach mathematics to seventh graders in, in the city. Uh, was this part of a alternate roots teacher certification program? Uh, actually, Wendy Kopp at, of Teacher America uh -huh. did indirectly get me my first job, uh -huh. but not through Teacher America. I was okay. too late for the application, so we, I just sort of snuck in the back door to the school that didn't have a math teacher weeks before it was supposed to open. Uh, so. I, I asked because my daughter was a product of the New York City Teaching Fellows Program, mm -hmm. which is kind of like an alternate roots program, <laughs> and she's had a very successful uh, career as a, in special education. But, and then she left the classroom after a number of years, and uh, she became in increasingly interested in self-regulatory and self-control mm -hmm. issues, uh, really non-cognitive kinds of things that that are uh, that influence student outcomes and develop long-term developmental outcomes success in school retention uh, in college and the like and uh, she she's continued her work and as you know she's opened up a character lab at the University of Pennsylvania which is designed to think about both the science and practice of character development and I think she'll talk with us about these ideas. Uh, she's probably most famous now in the popular literature for her recently published book about grit which she defines as uh, the uh, as perseverance and passion for long-term goals and so uh, uh, Angela has agreed to speak with us today to have an informal conversation that mostly focuses on her perspective about how these ideas uh, might help inform our practices as folks committed to uh, promoting the development of teacher candidates who obviously are being trained to positively impact the students that they serve. And uh, we wanted to get her perspective about it. And in advance, three questions were given to us. Uh, I, I told uh, Angela that I would share these questions as a starting point. But this is a conversation, so you should feel free to chime in, uh, to share your thoughts. But I ask, because we are recording this session, that if you have a comment, please raise your hand. We'll give you a microphone. Uh, one person speaks at a time, so this is not a debate for the presidential election. <laughs> Uh, one Good. person speaks at a time, and, and uh, well, that way we'll be sure to have the entire recording and everyone's thoughts on tape. So, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So, this first question has to do with uh, preparing our prospective teachers and their influence on student long-term developmental outcomes. And, you know, one of the things our schools, what we should be doing in teacher education programs is uh, training prospective teachers. So so that they're better able to not only promote the academic learning of their students, but their commitment to their long-term developmental goals. And unfortunately, these qualities oftentimes aren't emphasized in teacher education program. You know, we tend to focus on uh, making sure that they know how to teach mathematics or they know how to teach social studies and the like, but these character issues are oftentimes really not front and center and they play a significant uh, influence on the long-term outcome. So how do you think we should be thinking about this issue, especially with respect to preparing teachers uh, who are going to be working with kids who come from different backgrounds, who have diverse life experiences, who have very different identities than kind of usually the middle class mm -hmm. kid? So it's a great question, and maybe I'll begin with a definition of character, because we've all used that word character, but sometimes we mean Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, and sometimes we mean other re you know ways that we use the word character, and I think the uh, way that I'm using it is closest to what Aristotle defined as character. That is, all of the things that a grown-up or a child does or thinks or feels that are beneficial to the self and to others. It's really a broad definition. It is everything from curiosity and creativity to emotional intelligence and perspective taking, and of course what I study, self-control, delay of gratification, grit. It's everything that you would want your own child to develop as they grow into adulthood so that they can contribute to society and also live a, a happy life for themselves. 
So that very broad definition is is how I define character. Other people, by the way, hate the word character for various reasons, like it sounds fixed, uh, which I don't believe that it is, and neither did Aristotle. And uh, you know, maybe it sounds moralistic, which is not a connotation that I embrace, but um, just for clarity's sake, when we use the word character, I really mean it inclusively of all those things that honestly, I've never met a teacher who didn't say, yeah, I would like my kids to, to have that or to develop that. So I think there's a lot of consensus really around you know, the idea that it, there's a lot of stuff that we want a kid to do, including writing well and reading well and doing mathematics, but also treating other people well and you know, knowing how to control their emotions and their attention and so forth. So that's what I think about what character is. And in terms of teacher preparation, I was a teacher for not a long time, for collectively about five years in uh, various public school systems, including New York City, where I started. I also ran a summer school for little kids, uh, middle school and uh, sort of high elementary school kids. And that was for two years. So I would say that for a fraction of my adult life, I was actually with kids on a daily basis. And I didn't do such a great job of intentionally developing the competencies that I'm talking about. I tried, as I think every teacher tries, but I was often doing things like lecturing them about their futures. And it generally doesn't work when you lecture a kid about how, you know, unless you start studying, you know, you're never gonna, be. it's like in one year out the other. And I, I think that as a psychologist, what I would like to see in teacher programs and honestly in culture generally is a much more sophisticated, enlightened approach uh, to, to developing character in kids. So, so what can we do beyond lecturing? The first step I think is to understand, you know, if a kid is doing their homework or if a kid is not doing their homework, Lectures are just kind of a, uh, like, okay, well then I'm just gonna tell you that you should do your homework. But I think first you have to understand why do some kids do their homework and why do some kids not do their homework? What, what motivational factors are at play? What experiences have shown them the value of homework? And actually, I would argue, there are skills involved in managing your life and maybe the kids like want to do well but they don't know how to organize their time, to ask a good question in class. So I guess to um, say very summarily what obviously could be unpacked if we had more time than we do today, I think teachers should be um, exposed to the scientific information about human motivation, about self-control, delayed gratification, grit, curiosity. There's a science behind every single one of those character strengths that I mentioned. And the understanding of where these things come from, I think is at least one step toward being a better teacher, better than uh, you know just telling kids that they ought to have more of these things, as I did for so many years myself. Um, and, and could education schools, for example, have a course in you know, if you don't like the word character, call it metacognition. If you don't like the word metacognition, call it non-cognitive strengths. If you don't like that, call it social emotional learning. Call it whatever you want, but I do think that there are lots of psychologists like me who would be very eager to help design such a course for graduate schools of education, for ongoing professional development, so that these insights from the laboratory could cross over into the classroom. I can say thank you now. Uh, I think the historical pattern in education schools, and I suspect in psychology departments, is that they sometimes think they solve a major problem by developing a course, right? And, and when, in, in fact, what you need is a systemic programmatic focus to ensure that these ideas are not only acquired, but actually applied and generalized because uh, I do study the literature on tra transfer, and I know that unless it's systematically programmed, you shouldn't expect to get it. So these are skills. Have you ever thought about it at the programmatic level? I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess that I am not uh, very good at or inclined to think systemically, though I recognize it's exactly what we should all be doing. But I am not a policy-oriented or systems thinking kind of, I'm like a psychologist, so mostly what I'm, what I'm interested in and what I tend to be good at is like understanding like what happens in between your ears. But obviously, you know, we all live in the culture and in ecology and, and I think uh, I know enough to agree with you that if, if, you, if you don't have, if, if, if you just try 
try to change one kid in isolation, but nothing about that kid's world has changed. It's not ritualized, uh, the things that you want them to do. It's not that they look to their left and they look to their right, and everybody's doing that. And, you know, it's not modeled by their teacher, and, you know, they don't see it, you know, happening anywhere else, like in the hallway of the class, you know, of the school. It won't stick. And I think one major lesson from psychology, uh, which you are well acquainted with, is that there are a lot of uh, short-term things. I mean, we've all experienced it, right? Like you go on a diet and it's going great, and then you're not on the diet anymore. Or you know, like, I gotta wake up every morning, go to the gym, and it works out great until you stop doing that. And so the well, question is, like, why doesn't behavior change stick? I mean, even if it's something that you know is good for you, I mean, we all know we're supposed to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, but like, you know, it often doesn't happen. Why not? Why is, why is good behavior not sticky? And I think we don't have a full answer to that question, but we know that when it is sticky, it is because it's reinforced at a systemic cultural level. When you go to France, which is where my family recently went on vacation, and I remembered my high school French, you know, really rusty, but I could like kind of order lunch, you know. Um, at the end of about a week and a half, uh, my French was so much better, obviously, than when I got off the plane. Because when you're in France, everybody speaks French. And every it's like exactly what you want. It's like everything reinforces it. You order in French. They talk back to you in French. You listen. You know, at, at the end of the trip, I was even dreaming in French. And I think that's what we want our kids to do. They need to be in a system, in an ecology, where it's not just like you have a 45-minute lesson plan on goal setting, and then you go off, and like nobody talks about goal setting, and nobody else. But, but every Everybody's learning that and everybody's doing it and your teacher's modeling it and you go to the next class and it's reinforced and you know the way that you do everything uh, essentially uh, creates a culture where uh, it's not even that you have to think about it very intentionally. Thank you. Uh, are there any specific follow-up questions related to this general theme that we've been discussing that anyone would like to ask at this time? So I think the question that was posed was directed at how can we help our pre-service teachers to then instill this in their future students. I'm concerned about instilling these type, these type of character traits in our pre-service teachers. They come through our program, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that I'm seeing um, the grit, the perseverance. Um, and I feel like there's so many factors that influence what they're able to or what they're willing to do in, for our, class, in our classes. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any ideas. You know, there's this James Baldwin quote about how uh, children may not listen to their elders, but they don't fail to imitate them, right? And I think that was just this intuition that, of course, psychologists nod their heads and they say, oh, right, that was the research at Stanford by Al Bandura showing that we model each other. You know, we model each other um, almost without knowing that we're modeling. And in fact, when you see these videos of very young children, the famous experiment at Stanford that your question brings to mind is called the Bobo doll experiment. And some of you may know it, but essentially behind a one-way mirror, psychologists observe a child playing with one of those inflatable bobo dolls you know you can you can uh, you know knock it over and it comes back up again well half of the kids before they get to play with the bobo doll watch a, an adult kind of just you know play with the bobo dolls if it were like any other toy and they're you know sort of like you know throw it and catch it or, and then the other half of the kids get to watch an adult play with the bobo doll and like beat it up and like, you know, try to destroy it. And the question is, what will children do when they have a chance to play with this doll, having seen a role model do one of two things? And it's really striking because the kids do exactly what the adults did. You know, they, they imitate them. And these are very young children. Um, and, and I think we all do that, right? We sort of end up talking like the people around us. We end up doing that. And that's why I think it is imperative for many reasons that if we want our children to be curious gritty, nice, honest people, then of course they need adult role models in the classroom who are all of those things. Now, how you would get there if you don't feel like we're there yet is obviously, um, you know, uh, a, a simple question with, it, with a probably complex and long answer. But, but I will say that in terms of grit in particular, 
I think that um, grit can be encouraged in young people who are entering teaching or otherwise. First, you have to think about the passion part of grit. And I think uh, the two major engines for passion, and you know, we're all, we're all in life together, so you might just reflect a bit on your own level of passion, and maybe you'll tell me, like, I'm so passionate, but I love what I do. And if you do say that, I would say there's probably two reasons why. The two drivers of passion are, um, one is interest. Like, it's interesting to you. I mean, psychology is so interesting to me. I have these articles on my desk, and I just want to read them. I just think it's interesting. It's like, oh. And when I go to Starbucks, and I'm waiting for my, you know, overpriced coffee, not overpriced, but they're very expensive, um, my very expensive coffee, um, you know, I'm interested in, like, oh, that barista does, you know, seems to be happier than that barista. Like, that's interesting. Like, I wonder why. And I'm watching them. I'm so interested. You probably have other interests. Maybe you're interested in sports. Maybe you're interested in baking. Maybe you're not interested in those things. Maybe you're interested in the election coming up. Maybe you're not. But interest is the one of the drivers of passion. And so, you know, what is it that brought people to teaching? In part, I think they must be interested in learning and interested in kids. And so that intellectual interest or curiosity, I think, can be encouraged. Um, the second driver, if you sit next to me on the train, if you come back with me to Philadelphia and you sit next to me on the train, I always ask the person next to me, do you love what you do? Which is an unusual question to be asked on Amtrak. But, um, but when that person says, yes, I love what they, I do, it's not just because they're interested, it's also because they feel that it's purposeful, that it is beneficial to other people. And I'm not kidding, there's no exceptions to this in my experience. So even when you, you, know, you talk to hedge fund managers, right, and you're like, oh, do you, do you love what you do? The ones who say, I, I love what I do, they will tell me why it's interesting to be a hedge fund manager, and they will also tell me how it's beneficial to humanity. I'm like, really? How can hedge funds be benefit? And they'll tell me what they, in their view, feel like it is. So I think if we want teachers to be optimally passionate, we have to, make sure that there are ways that they can be intellectually curious about their work, that it's, uh, that it's interesting to them in the same way that you know, the other interests in their lives grab them and that they would want to think about it on Saturday and on Sunday. And then secondly, we have to uh, make it possible for them to really feel like it's benefiting the world. Teaching obviously is supposed to benefit the world, but I think what happens to a lot of teachers, including what happened to me on occasion, and certainly when I was before teaching, I was a tutor and a volunteer, I often felt, and I don't know if this speaks to your personal experience, that I wanted to help kids, but it wasn't working. I mean, I was like tired, you know, I was working a lot of hours, but it's not, I mean, I see these kids and I'm like, yeah, pretty much did not help you. Like, I, you know, I'm here, but it's like, I'm not changing your life. So, so we need to create a school culture and a system and, you know, a lack of bureaucracy and a curriculum and so forth so that all that good intention has somewhere to go. And if you have teachers who are interested in their work and feel like when they come to work, it genuinely helps. Like the kids are getting better, they're going places uh, and they're able to do their best work. I think there you'll have teachers who themselves are grittier and then uh, it will, I hope, be a model for the students in their classroom. Multiple microphones, ooh. And there's more microphones. Just um, following up on that thought then, I'm wondering um, what schools or approaches that you may have seen for um, as educational approaches or philosophies that seem to create those kind of environments for children. Yeah, it's a great question about, you know, what are the schools where they, you know, they left an impression upon me. Um, you know, what most recently comes to, I mean, I've worked with uh, schools that look very different, actually. So uh, two of the schools that I know best are uh, the KIPP charter schools that serve mostly low-income kids, and they are pretty, um, you know, formal places. So it, they're, they are not the kind of like, put your, you know, leg up on the chair, you know, lean over and, you know, be kind of you know casually addressing your teachers by first name. That's like not the culture of those schools. Uh, at the other extreme, I've worked a lot with the Riverdale Country School, which is one of the highest tuition private schools in the country, um, which makes it one of the highest tuition private schools in the world. And these kids are from uh, from many backgrounds, but many of them are from extraordinary privilege, and that has a different culture. So when I sat in the back of a Riverdale classroom, I was like, wow, these kids are literally drinking 
drinking cappuccino in history class and they are having their you know foot up on the seat because it's more comfortable for them and they're kind of you know it's very casual so oftentimes I think schools that are promoting uh, character strengths like grit can look superficially very different but the two elements that they invariably have are high expectations and a culture of um, of genuine affection for the kids by high expectations I mean that the work is never done it is never good enough it's not like oh 100% smiley face like that was great it's like that was wonderful I think the topic center could be a little sharper. It's like, this is great, you got all the problems right, that means I need to make the assignments harder, right? They're just, they're never done. And actually, uh, you know, this high challenge environment is also in um, exactly how I would describe places like West Point or, you know, sports teams that are really good at encouraging people's best. They're, they're just, it's not an easy place to be. But the second element of that is the uh, the love part, right? I mean, tough love is one way to think of this. So these places are tough in some ways, but they are genuinely loving. They are affectionate places. Kids feel safe. Um, they, you know, kids are like dogs. They know, right? They know if you care about them or not. Um, and I think in a in a a sports team or a classroom or in a military academy where people genuinely feel honored and respected and and loved, you know, when I send my 14 and 15 year old to school, you know, I hug them and I'm like, I love you so much. Like, you're so awesome. You drive me crazy sometimes, but like, I totally love you. That is essentially what we want for our kids and our classrooms. Tough, because you know what? That can be better and you can be better and we get, but unconditional love, right? And, and unfakeable affection. Those are the two common elements, I think, to great cultures. Any other questions related to this uh, theme? Hi, uh, I was also a middle school teacher in New York City for several years, um, and worked, have worked with both KIPP schools and Uncommon schools who have done similar work. And one of the things I was just wondering about is, given what we know about the trauma associated with poverty, and often with minority status, the microaggressions that come with that, both of those schools have grit report cards and character report cards. And I've seen kids feel like it's yet another bludgeon that an institution comes at and says they're not good enough in this particular capacity. And I was wondering what you would suggest or how to support that process more. Yeah, I can say more about what those report cards are and the evolution of them and how I really feel about them. Because I was part of this whole process so the charter schools asked me, the charter schools, KIPP in particular, um, asked me to create a character growth card for them. So they originally called it a character report card, but then they wanted to uh, suggest that this is growable, so they called it growth card, like growth mindset. And so uh, I said, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Like, what are you looking for? And they said, well, when we talk to kids about, you know, grit or curiosity or zest, you know, it's like very abstract for them and they don't have any idea what we really mean. So we want there to be, you know, indicators or sentences that are like really specific like um, you know I know how to show appreciation to other people or you know I have tried something really hard and and given up you know in the last six weeks or and I said okay well that makes sense and I said well, what's this for and we were talking a little bit about consequential validity this idea of like well the idea of whether a growth card works or not depends on what it's for like what's it supposed to do and they said well we want it to be feedback for these kids so that they can uh, you know just like an athlete is like oh well, how many seconds was that lap oh, okay good I'm gonna use that information to grow so like okay well that that could make sense so so what we did was we developed a growth card where there are indicators, sentences that are kid life sentences, like things that would be a way of expressing or showing that you have grit or curiosity or these other things in the classroom. The important thing for me was that, that it not be like a real report card. In other words, it doesn't go in your record. And I was very wary of the possible motivational backlash or the downside of this that you didn't think about when you designed the thing, but like, oops, it really did that. And here's what I think they found. 
in, in the cases where it is used simply as a conversation starter, like a reflection piece, like, oh, this is interesting, this is what your teachers are observing about your strengths and also areas where you need to develop, I think that can have very positive consequences. But it can be very negative too, right? So you might think like, hey, I'm gonna tell you that you really need to work on you know, finishing what you begin, and hey, that's gonna motivate you. But it might not motivate the child. It actually might make them even less motivated than they were. So I'll tell you where we are right now, which is that with those schools, we're trying to figure out you know, what is the optimal way to give kids some feedback, because I really do believe everyone learns from feedback, but how do you do it in ways that are, that are encouraging and not discouraging, and also do, um, are sensitive to the, you know, the lives that these kids lead? So one thing that I know from my research that's incontrovertibly true is that stress has a real impact on the brain and on the body, and when you are feeling that you're threatened, and we've all experienced some of this, but the kids that we're talking about have experienced some things that none of us have experienced. When they have stress, the experience of feeling threatened uh, beyond what they can do, uh, it precipitates physiological changes that encourage them essentially to act fast, act impulsively, and often not act in their long-term best interests. That's actually pretty good if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, and that's what the stress system has evolved to do, is like, you know, threat, kind of fight or flight. Uh, but it, can we have a, an instrument or something that provides feedback to kids but is not tone deaf to these realities? Because if a kid is impulsive, for example, in my research, what we have documented to be true is that it very often is downstream of stress, that you know their parents are fighting, somebody in their neighborhood got shot. That is making them feel this stress response which is in decreasing their ability to control themselves. So um, if you can do all of that, of course, uh, is a question not a, a certainty. Um, and I'll just give you a hint of what we're looking at. You know, I think that um, one thing we are uh, trying to figure out is whether we can give feedback to kids without it being comparative. So without it being like, oh, according to the class average, you know, you are two points below. But it's because it's not about other kids, really. It's about you. So who cares about the other kids? So one thing we're doing that. And, um, and the second thing is, you know, we're thinking that there are some things that kids uh, do, like they go on Facebook. Well, they don't go on Facebook, that's for old people. Uh, Instagram, they go on Snapchat, right? They go on Vine. And on all these social media things, um, there are likes. And so if you notice, none of these social media things have dislikes, right? So you can post something and you get lights. And by the way, if you have a kid in your house or you work with one, you're like, that is an extremely powerful motivator, how many likes they get and how fast they get likes. So is there a way to give kids feedback in a positive way, which is that when they do something good, maybe not something bad, but something positive, that we have built in a way in the school to uh, shine a light on that, to give them feedback that everybody really liked it when they, you know, shared their pencil or that they, you know, showed up in class and, you know, asked a question. Um, is there a way to do that with all the positive benefits of feedback, but none of the negative ones? Thank you. Yeah, I was unaware of this grading scheme that you've been consulting about, but I was thinking especially in light of your work on self-regulation and self-control and goal setting, that it would, it seemed that it would be a natural to have the score, a result of the scorecard, thinking of the consequences again, focus on goals for improvement, right? That would be discussed and negotiated between the adult and the kid. Yeah, and I'll give you another example. So one of the KIPP charter schools in Philadelphia, and those of you who know this charter school system know it's it's like a loose confederation of schools. I mean, they're very different from one to the next, even though they're all KIPP schools. So the KIPP school that's closest to my university home at Penn is in Philadelphia, and the principal there uh, did, did the following. He had this, you know, quarterly growth card with feedback from your teachers on, you know, strengths and needs, very specific to, like, kid behaviors. But on the back side, he photocopied be it a goal setting exercise that we had also worked on with him. And, and essentially it was, you know, look at the front of the card, like flip it over, you know, write down what your highest uh, strength was, like what was something you got a lot of praise about this last marking period, okay, now flip it back. Now um, what one did, you, did your teachers seem to be in agreement that this is something that's a need for you to develop, okay. And then there was an open-ended thing like, 
given all of this, like just set one goal for the next quarter, right? Don't try to work on everything. Just like what's one thing, like one of these indicators, one behavior that you personally feel like you would like to improve upon and then make a plan. And we gave them a little structure for making a plan. They're called when then plans, when, and then you fill in the blank, like when it is Thursday, then I will, you know, ask Mr. Garrity for math help, whatever it is. And that he said was the single best thing that came out of this whole exercise was that it was just a way of giving them information that led them to set a goal and make a plan. And it wasn't work on everything. It was, as all good teachers know, work on one thing with, uh, and, and actually maybe that's the only thing we've been thinking about this, like maybe they don't need feedback on everything. Maybe maybe it's just feedback on the one goal that they had, right? So, um, so we're definitely a work in progress. In our lab, we're all saying like hashtag work in progress um, because we all feel like that personally and we feel like that about our work. But, but that's the direction we're going in because of course science knows that goal setting and planning is enormously powerful, maybe the most powerful practical self-regulation tool that's ever been discovered is making a plan. So um, we need to connect the dots. We need to connect feedback to plan making with kids. As long as those goals are realistic and the practical consequences of responding to them are obvious to the person who sets them, right? So that's a, yeah. That's we cool. have a technique for helping kids discover their goals that are less real. So so sometimes we start this exercise. We call it a wish because goals is like adult language. So um, wish sounds better, right? So it's like oh, let's make a wish, right? Like what's a 24-hour wish? Something that you wish would happen in the next 24 hours. Like what's a lifetime wish, right? Something that you wish would happen to you um, for your lifetime. Time. And oftentimes, kids will put things in there like NBA player or you know rap star. And of course, somebody's got to end up in the NBA and be a rap star. But the, it's it's a very much a law of small numbers game, right? And I actually looked up how many uh, NBA players are taken new each year, and it's very small. Um, so so you kind of the teacher in you wants to be like, uh, okay, well it's not really realistic. So can we set? But that's actually not psychologically smart because if you tell a kid that their wish is not realistic or feasible, I mean, you're right, but it's not going to land on open ears. So we do the following, it's called a mental contrasting exercise. And again, it comes from psychological science. So like my whole life is gonna be like running back and forth across the border between psychological science and education trading messages, right, insights from these two fields. So uh, what, what researchers have found is that if you contrast the, the kind of positive fantasy with the negative reality, it's called mental contrasting because you indulge in this fantasy of like, let's elaborate, what would it be like if you were in the NBA and they're like, oh, it'd be great, I'd like a really big car and I'm like millionaire and you know, they're very good at the fantasy part. And then you say, okay, great, like awesome, spend a few minutes, then we, uh, we, we ask them, oh, Ended, we don't say anything. We're like, so um, what, what are some of the obstacles that stand in the way? Like, why might that not happen? Like, what are the obstacles? So then the kids are like, well, you know, I'm not that tall, or like, you know, I, um, you know, they, they name all the obstacles and they themselves can help titrate a little bit the feasibility, but it's much more effective than us shortcutting the process. I mean, this takes like a half an hour, like, oh, let's fantasize. Oh, let's talk about the obstacles. And I'll, maybe I'll give you my own personal example. When I learned this technique, the psychologist who developed it at NYU said, well, you should do it on yourself. And I was like, all right. They're like, well, make a wish. I was like, my wish is to write more papers. I mean, I'm a dork, so I was like, my wish is to write more academic papers with uh, Jim Heckman, who's this Nobel Prize economist at University of Chicago. Chicago. I'm like, okay, great. Fantasize now. Like, what would that be? I'm like, oh, it'd be so awesome. Jim Heckman is a total genius. You know, we could bridge economics and psychology. So I went on and on with my like little dorky fantasy. And they're like, great. Okay, so what are the obstacles that stand in the way? And I was like, well, Jim is like super busy. He's literally writing nine books right now at the same time. He has like a lab of 45 people in Chicago and I'm not there. And so I'm like the last priority in his list. He doesn't like to talk on the phone. So I have, I mean, it's just like impossible to communicate with him. I got to like the 19th obstacle and I was like, okay, this wish is not happening. Like it's not happening. Like none of these things are things that are within my control. And once, sometimes when you do this goal setting exercise, what happens is the person changes the wish. And that's what happened to me. I was like, look, 
it's not a viable wish. So I'm going to make a different wish, right? Which is that I'm gonna try to work with this other person who is actually more available. So I think that exercise is illuminating because it tells us what we could do with kids. We can listen to them and guide them gently so that they can come to their own conclusions about the reality of their situation rather than the way I used to do it as a classroom teacher was just like tell them. You know? And that you know, didn't work for me and I don't think it generally works. That other person wasn't Daniel Kahneman, was it? No, I have not tried to, yeah, I think that would have like 25 obstacles for why Danny probably. Kahneman doesn't want to hang out with That's me, although he's very nice. No, he's, he's very nice. Yes, he's he brilliant. is nice, he's very busy. Yeah, I had, a, I had a, a, a developmental experience like this with my daughter, but it was, it was much more expensive and took much longer to develop. She, she aspired to be a professional dancer, and she was an excellent dancer. Uh, she danced at the school for the Pennsylvania Ballet. She danced at the school on scholarship at the Joffrey Ballet, a number of other places. And then she tried out for the New York City Ballet. And she had this as a vocational goal. Uh, and she was turned down twice. And she came to the conclusion she just wasn't good enough to dance professionally because uh, she couldn't get into the New York City Ballet. And so what happened next? Well, what happened is that she went to Penn <laughs> and uh, she got a degree in philosophy, thought she'd go to law school, and she ended up working as uh, uh, in the New York City Teaching Fellows Program. She oh, worked in the New York City. Same daughter, same daughter, yeah. okay. And now she's back from Hong Kong after eight years and about ready to have her second child. So. Uh, Life goes on, but she's, she's yeah. done terrifically well as a, a teacher and an advisor for uh, kids who work with, uh, uh, teachers who work with kids with special needs. So that's her commitment, mm. her passion. She works with severe, kids with severe disabilities and she's doing a wonderful, wonderful, has a wonderful life and has a great, a great situation. So. You know, and it's a, I'll just say that, you know, grit is all about sticking with things, but you know, it's, it's not always obvious to us what the, the, you know, we can't really see around a corner, as my roommate's mother used to say. You know, we can't see around corners. And so sometimes kids have this, like, one view. It's like, I have to do this, and this is the only way that my life can be good. But they can't really see around the corner, and then there are other options. And here's a homework assignment that, if you, if you, if you permit, I can give to you today, which is that um, if you think more abstractly about your life, like I want to be a ballet dancer, or you know I want to be a tenured professor at you know UD in psychology, like these are very specific goals. But I will give you this homework assignment in one sentence of ten words or fewer. See if you can within the next twenty-four hours um, write down your life goal. You know, one sentence that it's probably going to be pretty abstract that could say like this is what your life is for right and um, when you get to 10 words or fewer which is very hard which is why I'm gonna give you 24 hours to do it um, it's interesting because there are many things that could maybe get you to that life goal there are many particular actions or pathways my life goal and by the way it took me a few months to actually be able to write it in 10 words or fewer is to use psychological science to help children thrive and there are many ways I can do that. I can stay in my university as a professor, I go to others, I might quit academia and just run a nonprofit to make this happen. So I think actually it'd be interesting if you could ask your daughter, you know, what would be this kind of top level goal? Because um, this exercise also eventually could lead kids to understand like why they do have, you know, why do they wanna be a rap star? Like why do they wanna, you know, be a doctor? It's usually uh, because it means something even more abstract or a kind of higher level, and that also releases them. It gives them some flexibility. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you have to do it in this way. There are multiple ways. And there are multiple ways to discover what your true passion is, I think. Uh, you know, uh, I think your idea has uh, many uh, interesting uh, potential uh, positive implications for designing programs and courses of study and so on. And we've talked a little bit about some of these ideas, but, but you also know your idea has also been criticized as well. And one of the criticisms that's appeared in the public press, and I think Diane Ravage has actually mentioned uh, this issue as well, is that it, uh, the concept of grit, like the concept of resilience, places in the minds of some people the onus on the person. So whether they succeed or not is really because they possess this attribute trait or quality and, uh, 
And, and so like the resilience idea, the concern is that maybe we need to be thinking about removing unnecessary barriers so that way grittiness is not the defining or the determining feature in a person's life success. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think the criticism that when you talk about character or grit, the uh, you know the onus seems to be like on the child, right? Like on their shoulders, and then if they don't do well, it's like okay, your fault because you you weren't gritty enough, you weren't persevering enough. You know, I think that's a it's a very um, I wouldn't say it's. Um, misplaced at all. I think it's a really important thing for me personally to, to listen hard to. And it's a conversation that we're having actually right now in my lab. I'm on a committee of a sociology student. His whole thesis is on how grit can um, be um, used for ill purposes, um, unintentionally, of course, but still, I mean, it, you know, it, you're responsible for what you put out in the world, I think. Here's what I really think. As a psychologist, I would say that when you look at a child who is or isn't paying attention, is or isn't saying thank you, is or isn't generous, is or isn't honest, you know, you always have to ask the question as a psychologist, like, why? Why are they? And, you know, I don't believe that it's... Uh, all about genes. I think that a lot of human behavior is from accumulated experiences and lessons. And when this kid is driving you crazy because they're not doing something, you still have to say like, but why aren't they doing it? And when you say uh, to yourself, there are reasons why, it's very clear that the onus of responsibility falls not on that own child's you know, narrow little shoulders, but on everybody's shoulders. I mean, kids, are the product of their lives and their experiences. And, and we talked about stress as one particular example. We talked about role models or the lack of role models or maybe role models were not modeling things that are good for kids in the long run. All of those things matter. So in, in a hugely important way, I think the situation or the environment or the context, call it what you will, it determines in some in in many many powerful ways like the competencies that I study, and the second thing I was recently in the Baltimore Public Schools not far from here, and the then superintendent had written a grant. By the time the grant was gotten, they weren't there anymore. But I showed up for this grant. They were trying to increase grit in kids in Baltimore, and I, I, I said, let's you know spend the first year just let me just come to the classes and just like you know hang out in the back and see what's going on. And I will say that my experience in those classrooms was that the schools needed many things before they needed Angela Duckworth to come in and lecture anybody about grit. I mean, they needed curricula where kids were being taught stuff and they needed enough computers to go around so that the three kids that I sat next to wouldn't be sitting there for an hour and a half literally given nothing to do at all, not even a worksheet. Um, they needed uh, classroom management help, right? Because when a kid is being disruptive, the last thing you want to do is send them you know, uh, to the back of the class. Like, uh, no, that is actually not a good way to, um, to they, uh, they needed so many things and so the second the second thing I would say is that in addition to the environment shaping us and, and, and who we are, and if we wake up early in the morning and go for our run and so forth, it's not because we're necessarily better people, but we learned how to do that and it was modeled for us and encouraged. The second way that environment matters is that if a kid is in an environment where there's no incentive to be a passionate, persevering person, if there's nothing to be passionate or persevering about, you know, that, that of course they're not, you know, it's like grit's not even relevant almost in some context context where there's no opportunity. Um, and I'll close with this. In the book, I, um, I interviewed, well, I didn't really interview. I just took the words of ta Coates. Um, and I was actually, I mean, many of us are familiar with Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, uh, you know, meditations on race in this country. But what I had taken was this, um, this little speech he had given about writing, because he is a writer, first and foremost. And it was beautiful. It was like poetry. And I just wanted to like write it down in my own book, because I was like, this is uh, the he talked about how being a writer is, you know, dealing with your own horribleness on the page and like working at it, working at it. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to say. So I put him in there. New York Times does a review of my book and they're like, you know, Angela Duckworth is, you know, um, 
uh, ignoring poverty and structural disadvantage. And they, she even has ta Coates in her book. And I wonder what he would think about being in this book. Um, so I emailed him and I was like, hey, ta like like, uh, New York Times is going to like say this thing. I'm like, sorry, but like, you know, I did talk to you about this before. He wrote me back. And this is the gentleman that he is. He's like, that sounds stressful. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's kind of stressful when the New York Times thinks you like don't care about poverty or race. Um, and he was like, but you know, I'll tell you, like, I, I tell my kid to work hard. I, I work hard. I want my kid to work hard. I'm not telling my kid that like, you know, that, that it's uh, anybody else's job to work hard and do, do well. But obviously, I care a lot about the system in which my kid is growing up. And I was like, well, that's the subtlety that I think has to be expressed. Um, and then I'll say this at, to end it, uh, you know, and then he was like, you want me to call you? And I was like, oh my God, do I want ta Coates to call me? Yes, I do want you. Called me on a weekend. And we just had a conversation where we, we talked about like, you know, th that the, he, both he and I, I think, feel like when you write a book and you try to say something in the world, you know, it can sometimes not be interpreted exactly the way you wanted. And the mature thing to do is to take responsibility for that, but also to, um, you know, to, to just keep trying to say more clearly what you do think. Um, and so that's what I took from that call. And uh, the other thing I took from that call is that he's an extremely decent person uh, who didn't really need to call, you know, a relative stranger and to, and to share some of that. So I do care about uh, these issues. Um, I don't face them. You know, I, 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 like I, I think there's a limit to my empathy because I have not been, you know, a marginalized person in our society. But they're really, really real. And a psychologist who's worth her weight will say that uh, ultimately, eventually, we all become sociologists because, you know, if you want to understand a one person, you always have to understand the culture and the society. I think also it's not fair to criticize you for arguing for the importance of these character traits and creating environments that support their development uh, because that is important ultimately for all people, but uh, also, we have a responsibility to remove unnecessary obstacles to people's development. So these are not incompatible propositions from my perspective. How do you feel about that? You know, nuance is really hard to communicate, right? It's like just really hard. So I can say, look, I, I, I think that delay of gratification and competencies like gratitude and grit are, are important individual competencies at the same time, both and, right? Like, situations matter like that's where they come from you know like why does my kid know how to say thank you I taught her how to say thank you and she grew up in a safe environment where like saying thank you was praised and rewarded and natural to do so it's not either or it's absolutely both and but both and is very hard to communicate I think it doesn't really go viral you know like like either or goes viral I mean look at our election right like I just you know there's just so it's very hard to have subtlety and nuance and real conversation um, and so so I mean, that's why I was so excited to come today. I was like, oh, like, let's have a conversation and ask me, you know, ask me those hard questions because like it's in answering the hard questions that you can maybe get a little more to nuance. Um, but yeah, I, I think I also took for granted. I mean, anybody who's a parent or a teacher knows that the situation and the environment, the context matters enormously. So I guess I wasn't prepared in a way for that because I was like, duh, of course it does, right? I mean, if, if, if you walk to school in the morning and because of the color of your skin, people cross the street, like, duh, of course that's gonna change the way you see everything. But I didn't realize that that wouldn't be just an assumption, um, that, that you know, some people would not take that as a, as a given. Well, maybe you can think in the future about a book that discusses some of these issues, because I'm I- am not gonna write another book. Oh, you should write another, uh, you write a book. You write the book. I think you, you <laughs> did very well, and you know how to promote it, obviously, so. Uh, but uh, related to uh, technical considerations, we had mentioned before that you, you not only had been cr criticized this from a policy perspective, but there have been some meta-analyses done of uh, the grit construct and your measurement of it, and. Uh, some concerns raised about how well it predicts these later outcomes relative to other measures that are well established in the literature like conscientiousness and some of these other uh, uh, dimensions. So uh, as a result, I think some people are concerned that there may be people wholesale and uncritically adopting the grit concept and promoting instructional interventions that may not be efficacious. And I think 
some of the, the uh, uh, literature documents that some of the interventions developed to promote grit have not been especially efficacious. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about this issue? I think these are two related critiques. And, um, you know, I don't want to bore you, but I'll just tell you, like, the academic critique. The first one is that, you know, maybe grit's the same thing as conscientiousness, right? Maybe it's kind of, you know, old wine and new bottles, and you have this, like, sexy one-syllable word, but really, it's kind of what we've been studying for a long time. I study conscientiousness, too, actually, so I'm well acquainted with it, and here's the little personality psychology in 60 seconds. In, since World War II, psychologists have tried to map all of human personality and there are five major domains, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, otherwise known as emotional stability, but anyway, neuroticism, emotional kind of um, uh, ups and downs, um, openness to experience, that's kind of like an intellectual domain of personality, and then finally extroversion, right? So these like five really big domains, they're actually literally called the big five, and conscientiousness, the first one, is highly correlated with grit, so people who are passionate and persevering over the very long term tend also to be uh, self-controlled and dependable, punctual, orderly people, which is all the things that are in conscientiousness. The thing is, is that I think, and based on my own data, that they're not exactly the same, that you can have like punctual, dependable people who are not passionate about what they do and not extremely resilient in the face of adversity. Again, related, but not exactly identical. When we could, uh, you know, I guess go back and forth in academic journal articles about like, okay, you know, who's more right? But that is the criticism. And um, I would say also from my own data, and since we're talking about kids, when it comes to GPA, you know, their report card grades at the end of the year, um, there are other things than grit that are even more predictive, including conscientiousness and delay of gratification and self-control. When it comes to GPA, I've even published that result two years ago, which is like I said in my own paper, there are other things that are more predictive of GPA and also things like um, whether you, you know, stick to a healthy diet. And the reason is this, is that being passionate and persevering about a single life-giving goal is um, is not usually expressed through getting a great GPA or sticking to your diet, right? Usually people are passionate about something, I mean, some people are passionate about that, but for many other people, it's saving lives or, you know, social equality or, or whatever it is that's not exactly getting a good GPA. So I think there are differences between grit and other aspects of conscientiousness, but academics, that's what we do. We disagree, and I think that's um, it's fine to disagree and and you know maybe we're both a little wrong and maybe we'll learn something the second thing uh, that you said was that maybe some interventions aren't effective at improving grit I, Angela Duckworth, do not have a recipe for increasing grit in kids so I would not at all be surprised that there are many failed efforts to increase grit it's not easy to change behavior. And so though I believe that we should invest in this and we should care about it, this is not gonna, you know, this is what education always does. It's like, oh, here's the one, two, three, push this button, this button, and the, you know, standardized tests and accountability, and then everything will be fixed. It's like, hmm. Maybe it's a little harder than that. I feel like that about grit. Grit is not the only thing kids need. I don't know exactly how we should cultivate it. Kids are complicated, and so we're gonna need more patience, I think, to develop things that work better than we have today. And also, um, you know, I would hope in that kind of nuanced, uh, enlightened way of thinking about kids, it's not just about grit. And I tried to write that in my book, but maybe I should have written it better. I said in the last chapter that my own two girls are growing up before my eyes, and I don't wake up every day thinking like, well, I hope you're gritty and nothing else, right? I mean, of course, I want my kids to first and foremost to be honest and nice people. And by the way, being an honest, nice person is not the same thing as being gritty. And if I had to pick, of course I would pick honesty and niceness over grit. I happen to think that they could do all of these things, you know, so that's my view. But, um, you know, there's so much complexity, and I hate the, maybe this is why I don't read the newspaper and I'm not interested in politics and policy, because I always feel like there's an oversimplification. You know, like kids are complicated, and the worlds they live in are complicated, and poverty does matter. Race and race relations, in my view, 
hugely matter. So does modeling, so does grit, so does empathy, so does emotional intelligence, so does critical reading, so does having a better math curriculum. It's all of those things. So it's never either or, or like this is the simple panacea. It's a lot messier than that, but I think that as a country, we need to have more patience and more, um, you know, a tolerance for complexity, uh, because otherwise we'll just lurch from one simplistic solution to another and they'll never work. I think this is what happens when people bring their own particular model for seeing the world. They have limited perspective and they believe whatever the implications of that perspective are will solve the problem, but these problems are very, very complicated problems. Uh, I think we have time for one more question before Dr. Duckworth goes over to give her lecture. Any other questions? For much of my life, I've been called stubborn, including by my best friend sitting next to me, and sometimes even hard-headed, both of which have kind of negative connotations. I'm thinking, after reading your book, that perhaps my whole life I've simply been gritty. <laughs> Do you make any distinction among terms like stubborn and gritty, or is stubbornness just gritty gone to the evil side? Uh, so it's such a such an articulate question. You know, when I um, uh, first met a new professor in my department, he was like one of those like super famous, like he got recruited in. Everybody was like, oh, Phil Tetlock is coming to our department. He's really, really great. And the first conversation we had, he said, do you know what a Peabody plot is? And I was like, no, I don't know. And he was like, basically, you can take any characteristic like grit, uh, or courage, or, and then you can look at the mirror image of it, which is basically the same character strength or positive thing, but has negative connotations, right? So grit and stubbornness, right? So, so I said to him, like, oh, well, you know, I don't know much about it. Send me the paper. I read the paper. And um, I, I'll say this after, like, reading up on this and so forth. You know, I think the, the definition might be the same, but you're right. The connotation is different. So, um, you know, if, if you, um, if you really think about it, I think most uh most things like grit do have a possibility of being bad, right? There's like, there's a way in which you could be gritty that it would not be good for you, right? If you were, for example, gritty about the wrong goals, right? Like Hitler, right? Very gritty, not good goals, right? But very passionate and very persevering, but like very, very bad. Um, or if you could be gritty about the wrong level goal, and maybe we'll end on this. You know, I think that um, if you have a kid who's really gritty about a low level, like uh, it's a goal that is not feasible or it's like, you know, uh, maybe not in their best interest, you know, you don't want them to be gritty about that. And that's why I gave you that homework assignment because I think if you really reflect, first of all, I think most human beings, I mean, Hitler being the exception, but most children that I've worked with, you know, they really do have noble goals. Like they really, if they really reflect about what they want their brief time on this planet to be for, they often will think of things that are about other people. And, um, and that is what I want them to be gritty about. And I think sometimes when we use words like stubborn or hard headed, we mean that really the person is tenacious at the wrong level. But my guess is that you have very noble goals and that you are probably gritty at the top level. Um, so with that um, terrific way to end, I also want to thank you because these are the questions that make me smarter. Um, about my work and you've given me a lot to think about on my on my train ride home and uh, beyond so thank you so much thank you, Andrew.